What's up, everybody? This is Brian Easton, author of the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series, and this is Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter. Thanks for joining us tonight. So tonight we're going to begin our, uh, what we hope to be a the beginning of a regular series where we have some, some special guests appear on the show. They're, these are going to be people that I personally invited uh, to the Werewolf Bar to talk about their um, unique perspectives that they have on the book series and as they relate to these individuals uh, particular areas of expertise. But before we get to that, let's take a look at our creature of the night. As you probably know by the distinctive decanter, uh, this is Crown Royal. If you don't recognize the whiskey itself, you'll no doubt uh, know the brand from its famous purple drawstring bag that tends to carry everything from marbles to Bibles long after the bottle and the booze are gone. It's a Canadian whiskey uh, and it got its name, I'm told, in honor of King George VI's visit to Canada in 1939. Apparently he was the first uh, reigning British monarch uh, to, to visit the Great White North. And they say that when he left, uh, he took back 10 cases of this stuff on the train with him. So, as you know, uh, the Canadian whiskey isn't my uh, personal favorite. It's not something I'm partial to, and I really don't have strong feelings for it one way or another. But, to your health. Now, the Crown Royal isn't all that bad, as uh, I would say, as a sipping whiskey goes. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was fit for a king like its advertising execs uh, would have us to believe. Uh, but then again, I'm not trying to sell it. I should point out that this particular bottle is over 35 years old. And the only reason that I have it at all is because it was a gift from my wife's aunt uh, to me uh, when her uh, husband passed away. He was apparently fond of uh, buying Canadian whiskeys whenever they traveled. And um, this isn't the only vintage bottle or brand that I inherited from him. God bless his soul. So tonight we are pleased to present the first of what we hope will be several guests here at the Werewolf Bar. Uh, Dr. T. Broussard from Southern Louisiana, a true Cajun and a direct descendant of Joseph Broussard, uh, is going to be our guest this evening. Now Joseph Broussard, if you don't know, he led the first group of Acadians or Cajuns uh, from Nova Scotia and uh, the Maritimes uh, to southern Louisiana way back in 1765. It's an impressive pedigree and uh, so is Dr. Broussard's resume, uh, which includes 30 years of experience in the occult arts and sciences and is part of the reason why I asked him to appear on the show. As you know, my books are replete with occult references and traditions and these were not lost on Dr. Broussard, who is not only a longtime reader of the series, uh, but also has the expertise to be a professional critic as well, specifically in regard to those occult themes. So despite living with cerebral palsy, Dr. Broussard is also an instructor in the martial arts, specifically a discipline known as Kamuso Nindo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I've never been uh, very good with pr pronunciation when it comes to some of these more exotic uh, fighting styles. Uh, so I hope I pronounced that right. Dr. Broussard is also a prolific author and is, uh, has authored just shy of a dozen books on the occult and the supernatural. And uh, I'm going to share those with you at the end of tonight's show. Right now, let's get to it and let's hear from Dr. T. Broussard himself. This is Dr. T. Broussard speaking on the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series as a part of Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. I am an author myself, not a fiction, but on theology and occultism as well as martial arts. I came across the series Diary of a Werewolf, excuse me, Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter while researching one of my own books 
upon reading the series, I discovered that this is a series of books that lets the werewolf be the werewolf, the beast, in full. And all of its horror, and all of its power, while focusing on the effect of hunting such a beast on the human psyche. The trauma the main character suffers as a result of this hunt, the beast, is very like the PSG of a soldier in war. You see the toll it takes on the character. And you see how a true hero may not always be heroic in the sense of there are times the main character is a terrible person, but ultimately does things that achieve the greater goal in his mind of defeating the beast. Now, I have to give the author credit for building a consistent world, drawing a real werewolf mythology in the sense of using Montague Summers, using the Book of the Werewolves, drawing on the legends of Pierce Trube and others, uh, mentioning the Garnier family, mentioning the Gandillon family. And these are, these are parts of real lycanthropic folklore. He draws heavily on shamanic modalities of spirituality, which are perfect for the character that he's developed. Because, of course, the character's father is Catholic, and the character's mother is part Native American, and his grandfather is a shaman. So, in these three ancillary characters, you have the entire paradigm of the main character and everything that the character experiences filters through this prism. You have a worldview that is, that is very much in keeping with actual occultism in which multi multiple paradigms are able to coexist. You have the kind of absolutes that can only coexist in an occultic framework because within occultism, paradox is not only possible but expected because to an occultist, all beliefs are true because the consciousness of the individual has a great deal to do with what exists for that individual in occultism. Whereas in classical religion, the paradigm of the religion functions with or without belief. That's why in order to be righteous according to that religion, you have to invest in that religion because it's objective in a sense. Whereas occultism, shamanism, things like that, they are admittedly mostly subjective. No. An important factor in these books that I think the author does beautifully is with all the fantastical elements going around, you know, werewolves and spirits and such, he has his main character. Sylvester Logan, dealing with real-world consequences for his actions. He doesn't just kill a bad guy werewolf and go off like a hero. He has to deal with law enforcement. He has to deal with government entities and things that don't always believe him as to what he's up to. He makes allies. He makes enemies. He finds out that some would be Allies are in fact enemies, and the fact that stress can make some enemies and temporary allies. These books are a true 
hero's journey for the main character. He goes from an idealistic would-be hero to an anti-hero to a, a resigned warrior in which he does what is right regardless of whether he comes out or not. It is when he is fully resigned to his fate that he achieves a kind of peace, if you want to use that term. I would not normally, but for this context, it's appropriate. Now, these books are beautifully written. The author manages to bring the 80s back to life. And for those of us who remember, or mostly remember the 80s, it's a very beautiful thing uh, back in our lives, even if it's just for the moments of reading a book. Um, I have to give the author a compliment for bringing Yannis Grosini into his books, because Yannis Grosini is one of my favorite fictional characters. He began life in a series called Cold Check the Night Stalker, and later was revived in a series called Werewolf. Now, the interesting thing is, in Cold Check the Night Stalker, the self saying Yannis Grosini was portrayed as a vampire. Whereas in the series Werewolf, he was portrayed, obviously, as a werewolf. The interesting fact about that is, in some legends, a werewolf in life becomes a vampire after death because in many parts of the world, werewolfism, werewolfery, is a discipline of witchcraft or sorcery, particularly in France, where my ancestors are from. In those countries, you don't have as many witch trials as you have werewolf trials. So, the fact that Squizzini is played in, is played in different mediums as being a werewolf or a vampire is not the hybrid of postmodern media, but in fact a return to the original mythology in many cases. Now, beside the fictional Yellow Squizzini, this is also present in the fact that Bluebeard Jodore, in different sources, is described as either being a werewolf or a vampire, depending on the author. Now, the acts of criminality in both cases are murder of children and consumption of blood as part of alchemical and necromantic ritual. Um, and more often than not combined with the version of a devil or a demon. Again, the terminology of werewolf and vampire there becomes somewhat interchangeable. And there is a further precedent in the fact that in the court records of Peter Stube, or Peter Stube, whom some consider the first recorded werewolf, He's referred to as a drinker or sucker of blood. You know, the other interesting thing is that the author of Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter brings out is that there, there are within lycanthropes different breeds, although for his mythology they all come from the same infernal source. Some can speak, some can the change, some have no control at all, some have mind and can speak, do magic, things like that, 
and some are simply slaves of the moon. You know, one of the author's talents is to give both the hero and the beast a clear and concise voice that the reader can identify and really understand both points of view without making either point of view sympathetic. Because as I said, there are times when the main character is an asshole, a psychopath, a psychopath due to trauma, but a psychopath nonetheless. You know, he doesn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to hunt werewolves. He's hunting werewolves. He's hunting the beast because of what they did to him. It's a vendetta. And he suffers for that vendetta. And others around him suffer for his vendetta. And so you have the cost of being a hero. And at every point, in the main character's journey. He's offered easier ways of life and even easier ways of pursuing his vendetta. At one point, he has, is offered the power of Wendigo, which is a vampiric spirit, equal and opposite to that of the Lancanthrope, that would enable him to best the werewolf on its own terms but to do so he would have to sacrifice his soul essentially he would have to sacrifice his integrity and so the struggle becomes is my vendetta worth my soul is defeating the enemy worth becoming a monster myself and it's not for me to reveal what choices he makes but the point is these questions are asked eloquently and poignantly by the author for his character autobiography of a horrible hunter deals with fantastical things with reference to real things things like um, the 4P movement, the Process Church, um, gangs in prison associated with Satanism, and all of these real-life forms of criminality, including drugs like adrenochrome, that have their role have their role in some strands of occultism. And while I can't speak to reality the effects of these things in magic, I can speak as an occultist as to the fact that some people do use these things for good and ill purposes. Some of these associations in the book are real. Now, all that being said, there's also a lot of humor in these books, at least humor from my perspective, probably a little more jaded and sarcastic than most, but the humor is there. And throughout the books, the character is learning, and rather than constantly adding to the world and mythology of his own books, the author over time only makes his world more clear and more concise, his mythology more precise over time. And the books are very much a meditation on revenge, its cost, and the idea that defeat, defeating a problem, solving a problem, 
Sometimes the cost of doing so is not worse than the result. But if it is worth it, one should pay the cost without regret. Because if your goal is to solve a problem, defeat the monster, kill the beast, well then that means you're willing to sacrifice the ease and comfort of home and all the things that, you know, people go to war to defend and they come back unable to enjoy. So again, you have defeating the beast being very much a metaphor for war trauma because the man's life is a war. And the book shows this from his side and from the side of the beast. You see both sides of war and you see the effect of both sides on the people in that world. I want to thank uh, the author for allowing me to speak and I would encourage those interested to look up my books at lulu.com. You can find them by looking for Dr. T. Broussard. And I have published many books. The ones that involve the werewolf or the loop guru would be the cultist de the guru, mysteries of the bone road, into the charnel house, witchery hymns, and the way of the heart of scars. And I just want to say again, thank you very much. And beware of the corn moon for those who observe such things. Thank you, doctor. If you want to know more about Dr. Broussard and his work, we encourage you to visit www.lulu slash spotlight slash cultus. We want to thank Dr. Broussard for taking the time to be with us tonight and for sharing his thoughtful analysis and occult expertise with us. I also want to thank you for watching Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter. And before you go, please hit the subscribe button down at the bottom of your screen if you haven't already. Until next time, happy hunting and mind the moon.